Great to see you here. Great to have you here. I uh, would like to extend a very warm welcome from me to any of you who are new or newish among us. Uh, if you are, you heard us mention the uh, newcomers evening that we've got tomorrow night. Would love to see you there so you can come meet some of us as team. Get us to, uh, to be able to meet you and get to know you a little bit, which is so much easier in those environments than it can sometimes be on a Sunday. Well, I hope you're doing well. I don't know if you heard the story about a mum uh, called Jane who, who called up on a Sunday morning upstairs to her son Michael and said, uh, Michael, it's time for church. You need to get up. And the voice came from, from upstairs, back down, going, I'm not coming. And so she said, Michael, it's time to go to church. You need to get up. He said, I don't want to go. She said, well, you've got to go. And this went on for a little while. And, and, and in the end, like she said, I'm going to give you 10 minutes and you need to be up and dressed and down here. He said, I'm not going. She said, you've got to go. He said, give me two good reasons why I should go to church. She said, number one, you're 42 years of age. And number two, you're the pastor. <laughs> As they say, the old ones are the oldest. I, I, I want to thank God that I love coming to church. Uh, and I thank God what he's doing here. I thank God as the pastor here, and uh, along with Esther, who's preaching up at Cove North, uh, I'm always excited to be in the house of God with you. And I uh, thank God for your faith and your willingness to enter in and come after God to pursue him. And it is such a joy. Uh, well, uh, today I'm going to speak on the subject of taking ground, holding ground. Taking ground, holding ground. Uh, I'm aware it's only one week ago that we came to day 21 of our 21 days of prayer. And I know so many of you were involved in that, were engaged. For me, I think we've been doing this for six years. This was, I think, the, the best we have done. The, the level of corporate engagement, the prayer strength in our evening prayer meetings, uh, the number of young people that were on board, the cohesion in John's gospel. It's like, oh, wow. Something happened, and I've had a number of conversations which have sounded a little bit like, number one, um, I'm sad that this has come to an end, and uh, I, I always feel like that, just to let you know, when we come to the ends of those times, but I've also come to understand that there are seasons of intensity and seasons of push that actually help lift you to another level. Even Jesus had 40 days of temptation in the wilderness and testing, led by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. But he came out different. He came, went in led by the Spirit. He came out, the Bible says, in the power of the Holy Spirit and entered into his ministry. He didn't stay in the wilderness. And we need some of these seasons in our lives where they need to not be the only time, but actually to come out is normal. So the first thing people said, oh, I don't want it to end. I get that. But what we've got to do is hold on to what we have won in those times. And, and, and that is the second thing of people saying, I don't want to lose what I've gained. And uh, that's not the only reason I want to speak into this, but it's one of the reasons I want to speak into this today. Because I've come to understand those who are serious about discipleship, those that are serious about their faith, about moving on in God, about being the, the people that God has called us to be. If you've ever prayed a prayer like, oh God, make me the man you want me to be or make me the woman you want me to be, then that sort of life needs to learn how to both take ground and hold ground. Can we say take ground? Take ground. And hold ground. <laughs> we need to learn to take ground and to hold ground. And there will be those seasons. I, I have come to see that the, the mature Christian discipleship mode is not a steady line rising kind of up and to the right. It's much more uh, rises and treads, rises and treads like a staircase. So what happens is we tend to go into seasons of shift, seasons maybe of pressure, of testing, of refinement, of faith, of stepping out, of pressing in something that will give us a lift or so we get new responsibility and we have to step up and we're daunted and then we start to function at a new level, not plateau, but actually the, the seasons of intensity will happen and then we live that out. And then if we don't lose ground, which we shouldn't, I'll talk about that in a bit, then what happens is we get ready for another shift season. And it's all about what, what I might call taking ground and holding ground. I'd like you to make your way to the book of Judges uh, in the Old Testament. If you have a Bible or you've got it on your device, why not turn there 
with me. We're going to go to Judges chapter 3. We're going to read about Ehud. Ehud was a left-hander. Any, any lefties? In, I'm a left-hander. Esther's a left-hander. Any other lefties in the house? Okay, Ehud uh, was a left-hander, and uh, that was very unusual in his day. And again, we'll make brief comment about that. I'm not at all unmindful of the current conflict and difficulties, the war, the pain in Israel and, and in Gaza. And as we talk about land in this area, I'm not in any way looking to make comment into that today, although I'm mindful of it. Uh, what I believe the Bible uh, teaches us in uh, Romans uh, chapter 15 and 1 Corinthians 10 is that we're to look on the stories of the Old Testament and learn from them, that there is warnings, that there is examples, that there is inspiration for us. So we look back and see there are spiritual principles being laid out in the physical realities of the Old Testament. That's how the New Testament says we should look on the stories of the Old Testament, why we can draw a lot of things out of this. It might help just to briefly for me to, to headline the, the geography for you because we're going to talk about Israel and we're going to talk about Moab, the Moabites. Now what happened was uh, in, in Israel, Israel established their occupancy in Canaan, the promised land. They moved in and if you were to look at the map of the Middle East at, at that time, you'd see Israel on, let me get this right to, for you, I'll do this for you. So this is over to, to the east. So that they are east of the Jordan River. The Jordan River runs north to south. The Jordan River really was the divider. It was the boundary line. And Canaan was to the east. And they went in and occupied the east. Moab were to the west. The Moabites who descended from Lot were over to the west. Now, you'll know that Israel uh, were captives in Egypt. That was down to the south. They passed north up through the wilderness. But then instead of going straight up into Canaan, they went round, round the sea and to the Jordan through Moab. Now, they didn't attack Moab. In fact, it tells at the end of Deuteronomy that they camped on the plains of Moab. In fact, it says that Moses died and he was buried in the plains of Moab. And from the plains of Moab, they looked out into Canaan across the Jordan River. And you'll know that at flood season, they crossed the Jordan River and they went in and they entered that. But in the story we're about to get to, Moab have come over and have occupied Israel territory. And God raises up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the left-hander. Now, I know also there are many places in the Bible where we would love a little bit more detail. I don't know about, I read so many things, I'm thinking, Lord, we could use a bit more information here. What does that mean? What, what happened there? And then there are a small number of stories where they give you kind of more than you needed. And you go, did I, did I really need that information? I need to give you a disclaimer. This is one of those stories. So here we go, Judges 3, 12 to 30. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, the king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. I should say that when you look over the Jordan River into Canaan, the first city you see is, is what? Where's the first city that Israel took? Jericho, right. Jericho is the city of Palms. I understand, I've never been, but I understand it is full of palm trees today. It's, it's called the city of palms. It's Jericho. So this is what, what we read here, that um, they went and they took possession of the city of palms, or Jericho. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. So they didn't just take territory. Moab overpowered Israel, and they were subject to them. Again, the Israelites, verse 15, cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer. This is the story of Judges. So the unfaithfulness of God's people, uh, him allowing their enemies to come and attack them, them then crying out to God, God raising a deliverer. And this kind of repeat cycle of behavior, which can be what happens in our lives if we don't make some better decisions. But he raised and gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera the Benjamite. The Israelites sent him with tributes to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, that's about 18 inches long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who carried it, but on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, those are the idols that the Moabites have set up, he himself went back to Eglon and said, your majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, leave us, and they all left. 
Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade and his bowels discharged. I did tell you. Uh, Ehud did not pull the sword out, but the fat closed in over it. Yeah. Uh, Then Ehud went out to the porch, shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. After he'd gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. They said he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them, and they saw their Lord fallen on the floor dead. While they waited, Ehud got away. He passed the stone images and escaped to Sirah. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab, your enemy, into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. Today, we're speaking about taking ground, holding ground. Don't focus on the fat. Uh, Focus on what God wants to do in your life. Uh, I don't go away from here, go, oh yeah, I remember, it, that was about the fat closing over the sword. No, 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 like there, there's something much more important for you today, which is how do you as a follower of Christ take ground and hold ground? This is what the Spirit of God wants to come and help us with, but I think this is a great story because not only do they take ground, but they secure the boundaries. This is really important. What they do at the end of the story, we'll come to it, is they secure the land for 80 years. There's peace in the land because they don't just attend to taking ground. They attend to the boundaries. They attend to taking hold, but also holding ground. When I'm talking about holding ground today, I mean those times where we make spiritual progress forward. It can look like a multitude of different things for us. When we when we grow in prayer, when we grow in the Word, when we deal with some of our, our inner thoughts or battles, our insecurities, Luke bringing a, a word earlier, some of the things that can limit us, they can stop us. And when we break through, they can be seasons of taking ground. When we push on in our walk with God, maybe for some of us, when we, we share our faith in the workplace or things we've been timid to do, when we, when we step out and Uh, and pray for someone who's sick, and maybe we've never done it before, maybe we've been too timid, but we get beyond that and we push through, we take ground. For me, when I I fasted for the first time for for two days, and I I had no food, I thought I was going to die, but actually I was okay, and I made it, and I took ground. And then a little bit later, I did five days, and then did seven days, then did 21 days, and each time it's like, I've taken some more ground of what I can do, preparing some time of seeking God and growing in my walk with God. You know, I, I didn't grow up in church, so, so some of you, you're, like, I do identify. I can remember being in, in church prayer meetings for the first time and not having the confidence to pray out. And rehearsing my prayer of what I was going to pray when there was a gap. And someone always getting in ahead of me. And then by the time I was ready to bring my rehearsed prayer, the prayer meeting had moved on. We were praying about something different. And I can remember because I, I wanted to break free from that timidity and be able to raise my voice in prayer. Now, it might be a really tiny thing, but for me, when I first prayed out in a prayer meeting, I, I, took, I, don't, know if I, I don't know if it was any good. But actually something happened because I broke out of my own limitation, my own timidity, my own restriction, my own self-consciousness. And sometimes it's these little things. We can take ground when we step out, when we step up, when we move into new territory, when we get stretched, when we do something we haven't done. We can take ground in our hearts when we allow the Holy Spirit to come in and, and convict us and challenge us. There might be areas of of unforgiveness or resentment or bitterness or pain or all sorts of of stuff. And when we bring it to the Lord, we allow the Holy Spirit in to heal us and to deal with it. They can be ground-taking seasons. Things that actually were on us, we didn't even realize were on us. And the Lord helps us and they get lifted off us. And they can be ground-taking seasons. All of these things could be ground-taking 
for us as a, as a church corporate, it's not just about individuals. There are seasons where we, we have taken ground. Last year, birthing into Coventry North, this, was a, this has been a church planting church over the years. It's not, it's not brand new, but, but in the last season, we, we hadn't planted churches for a long time. And so it's actually, it wasn't just that a new congregation is in the north. It's actually, we've, we've entered new territory of multiplication. And we've taken some ground in doing that. These can all be very significant. I also want us to, to understand here that the Lord raised up a deliverer. The Lord is spurring us on to be ground takers. That this is not about trying to impress the Lord or doing something outside of him. That he wants to be very much involved in the ground taking process in our lives. And my encouragement to you is that you track with the Holy Spirit. Allow him into those areas of your heart. Allow him into those areas of timidity so that God can move you forward and God can move us Forward. I'd like us to learn some things from the story of Ehud today. Three thoughts around uh, taking ground and three thoughts around holding ground. Firstly, ground takers refuse restriction. Can we say refuse restriction? Ground takers, those who are going to take ground, there's something within a ground taker that says, I refuse to be limited. You see, Israel was subject to Moab. That, that means that they were under Moab's thumb. They were under their rule. In fact, we're told that Ehud was taking a tribute. What does that mean? It probably means they were, he was sent to take a tax, to take something of the, the wealth of the land to come and bring it because they were subject. They were under Moab. They, it wasn't just the cost of doing that. It was the humiliation of doing that. And, and there was a restriction in the land. There was a restriction on Israel. But something rose up within Ehud because I am not going to do that. Now, the, the commentators would say for him to be a left-hander, this is no slight on left-handers, I am one. But in those days, you got trained to fight with the sword in your right hand and the shield in your left. They wanted the army to be able to line up and be sword, shield, sword, shield, sword, shield, not a lot of sword, shield, shield, oh, we got a left-hander out of whack. So basically, you got taught to wield a sword in your right hand, which probably means, the commentators would say, that if he was a left-hander, he was probably deformed in his right hand. You wouldn't be a left-hander probably if there wasn't an inability to use that. He could have thought, you know, who am I? Who am I possibly to be able to do this? Maybe it worked to his advantage. Maybe he was allowed into Eglon's presence by himself because he was deemed to be a non-threat. But something within him rose up. Something within him said, I refuse for us to be restricted. I refuse for us to be hemmed in. This is our land. The, the Bible says that when he saw the stone idols at Gilgal, if you know the scriptures, you'll know Gilgal is a place of consecration. It's a place of covenants. He would have known that. Gilgal was when God brought Israel in and renewed covenant with them and said, see today, I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. It is a holy moment. And he goes there and, and he says he saw the stone. He saw the Moabite idols that had been set up there. And it's as if something, why, do we, that, why are we told that? I think maybe something within him like, couldn't bear that. It's like, I, I want to do something with this. Now, the reason that I say that is because we, if we're going to be ground takers, we need something within us that's not going to be passive. Something that, that says, I, I, I don't want to stay in a place of limitation. I don't want to stay with this thing in my heart that actually I want to be free from. I, I recognize there are some things that I need to break out of. I, I thank God that I'm not what I used to be, but I know I'm not what I'm going to be. Lord, would you help me to move forward? I don't want to stay here. A holy discontentment. That says, thank you for bringing me this far, but Lord, I, I'm praying you'll help me to get further. There has to be something of a militancy, of a passion, of a desire to move out. I don't, does anyone want to move on in God, or is it just me? It's like, so something within us that says, God, would you help me? I don't want to just stay here where I am. Whenever we feel intimidated, whenever we feel inferior, insecure, a passive spirit will never take ground. Secondly, ground takers, they refuse restrictions. Secondly, they live intentionally. There has to be something within us that rises up, but then that has to translate into a form of action. 
It's great that, that Ehud has this sense of, of indignation, but then the Bible says he fashioned for himself an 18-inch uh, lethal double-edged. So what is he doing? In private, he's preparing. He's hatching a plan. He is deciding that he has got access to Eglon. Maybe he alone has got the ability. Maybe for 18 years, he's been on the tribute team, taking over the tribute, and he started to think, I could do something here. The Bible says that when he fleed there, he went down to Syrah, and there he blew a trumpet. Do you think he just found a random trumpet on the ground? Or do you think it's possible that he'd already thought, this is what I'm going to do? I'm going to kill him, and then I'm going to go to Syrah, and then I'm going to make sure that, that my mates, that AJ, is going to be there with a trumpet. <laughs> AJ, there's a plan. Don't tell anyone. I'm going to kill Eglon. Bring a trumpet. It says they went straight down to the fords of the Jordan. Those are the places in, in, in the shallow season. As we, we know, Israel crossed over in flood season. But the fords of the Jordan are the places on the Jordan where the water comes lower and you can cross over in the dry season. The fords of the Jordan were the places where Moab had come across into Israelite territory. And they went straight there, blew the trumpet. They went straight there to block off the exit routes. I'm telling you all this is, there's a plan. I don't think this just happens by accident. And for us, actually, if we're going to be ground takers, we have to make a plan. We have to be proactive. Don't think you're going to become the woman that God wants you to be by accident. I'm sorry to tell you, it won't happen. When I was 20, I thought I would become a man of God purely by the passing of time. And then when I got to 28, I realized that wasn't going to happen. I was going to be the same as I was when I was 20, when I was 50, if I didn't do something about it. And all the people over 40 said amen. Because this is a reality, but we have to be intentional. Something that says, I don't want to stay here, so Lord, I'm going to do something. Would you help me? And maybe that looks like getting some help. Maybe it looks like changing a confession. Maybe it looks like setting aside time to pray. For me, you, you know, because I've shared a lot, times of personal prayer and fasting have been massive breakthrough seasons. They, they've helped me in the risers of my life. But I've had to plan. The first time I did a full 21-day fast with no food, I did it by myself. No one did it with me. But I did it because I'm like, Lord, I don't even know what to do. To, I want to push further into you than where I've come. I don't know what else to do, so I'm going to try this. And something happened. It was a shift as I, as I was serious about seeking God. Something intentional. Ehud was intentional. Thirdly, ground takers act courageously. It's one thing to fashion a dagger it's another thing to plunge it into your enemy. I could see myself fashioning a dagger. I'm not sure about the next bit. But Ehud was courageous. Ehud went into that place. He, he told Eglon that he had a word for him. He did have a word for him. Moab's rule was ended. It was a word with actions. But he acted with great courage. He acted with incredible courage. He locked the doors. He slipped out. He blew a trumpet. He rallied Israel. They defeated 10,000 men. We have to refuse restriction. We have to live intentionally, but we also have to act courageously. We have to step out. And it can be some of those really little things. I can remember in my, my early walk of being a Christian, I, I came into a, into a church environment, a little bit like this, but I was very self-conscious as a 17-year-old. I'd never raised my hands in worship, and I'll be honest with you, I felt awkward about the idea. I remember standing next to my friend who I was doing A-levels with, and, and he was there with his hands, and I don't know if it was a religious spirit in me, but I felt awkward about it. But as I started to get to know God, I, I wanted to express myself in worship, and, and it's like, whew. <laughs> now, something, at some point, I was like, God, I, I, I wanted to express my worship, and I raised my hands for the first time. Now, that might seem like the tiniest thing to you, but when you're battling with timidity and self-consciousness, the first time I danced in church. Some of you never danced in church. You're too scared. It would do you good. 
break out. It might bless the Lord, but something will come off you. Hello? The first time I raised a shout in church. Listen, I'm British. Well, like, you, you got to understand. I know some of you, like, don't have the same level of self-consciousness. Some of us, we've grown up British. We are reserved. We are embarrassed about doing anything that might draw attention to ourselves. And particularly when you're a teenager. And I, but I needed to break out. Now, you might not think, that doesn't sound very courageous to raise a hand. Well, it was actually for me. It was, it was breakthrough. It was saying, I'm not going to stay hemmed in by my own self of self-consciousness. I'm going to break out. I'm going to be a worshiper. And if I look an idiot, I don't care. That's taking ground right there on the inside. And these things, they, they can actually be part of our journey moving forward. Every bit as much as doing an extended fast or praying through the night or, or, or doing something that's going to grow you spiritually. We need courage. I remember the first time I, I was asked to preach at, at Trinity Christian Center, Singapore. And some of you have been around. You remember me coming back. I, I, I put a picture of the auditorium up. It's an incredible auditorium. It's a 50 million pound auditorium. 3,200 people. They had three services. And I got invited to go and preach by Pastor Don. And I made the mistake of going on their website and reading the list of guest speakers for the year. <laughs> Apostle George Wood, overseer of 350,000 churches across the globe, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Martin Story <laughs> from CLM. I remember how tiny I felt, how insignificant I felt. Oh, I felt I had nothing to say and nothing to give, that I couldn't preach anything they hadn't already heard. A wrestle on the inside, trying to wriggle out of doing it. Please, Lord, send somebody else. But I remember going, Lord, would you help me? I remember that, like, it, I mean, I'm not talking about imposter syndrome. I'm talking about raw fear. I remember phoning Mary, like texting of it, saying, please pray, pray for me. But then by the grace of God, overcoming fear, stepping up, bringing the word of the Lord. And I say this to, to honor the Lord. That they, they selected four messages that year as their keynote messages for the year. And, and the one that I bought was one of them. And, and, I, and I say that to, to say sometimes you just got to break out of where you are and let God use you. On paper, I didn't have anything to say. But actually, I heard the voice of the Spirit. And he wanted to say something even through somebody like me. He might even want to say something through someone like you. Am I speaking to anybody today? We've got to be willing to take ground. The second thing is we, we've got to be willing to hold ground. Uh, it's a tragedy where, when somebody takes ground. You sometimes see it, people that are they're compromising sexually, or like sexual immorality, and, and then, then they, they come to the Lord or come back to the Lord or get serious in the walk, and they deal with it, and they set some boundaries, and they start walking in the liberty and the freedom of victory uh, and not the, the tyranny of walking in sin and trying to, to serve God. Uh, and they take great strides forward, and then, and then they go back to where they were, and you see that the ground that they've taken they've now lost again. It's a tragedy. But I want us to understand that although it's possible to lose ground, it's not inevitable. I believe in the Christian walk, but what we, what we should be doing is taking ground and holding ground. There's not an inevitability about losing ground. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and, and stand firm. Can we all say stand firm? Yeah, the battle is not against flesh and blood. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, against the rulers, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. That what, what is the Bible telling us? What's Paul telling us? He's saying there are times when all hell will break loose against your life. And in those days... Put on the armor of God and do what? Don't retreat. Do what? Do what? 
stand on those days. There's time to take ground and there's time to... Yeah, stand your ground. So on that day when evil comes, you may be able to stand. Read it with me. You may be able to... Your ground. And after you've done everything to what? Take ground and hold ground. We can lose ground, but we don't have to. It's not that the idea of you win some, you lose some is not a kingdom idea. The kingdom idea is you win some and you hold some. You win some, you defend some. I want to encourage you that, that although it's possible to throw ground away, it's not inevitable. And this is the challenge for us. So Lord, help us to take ground and help us to hold ground. Help us to stay steady. Help us to hold on to what you have enabled us to win. David's mighty men, Eliza, Shammah, they stood their ground. Eliza, until the sword froze to his hand, but he refused to give up the land. He slew the Philistines, and he said he was a mighty man. I'm looking in this church for mighty women and mighty men who will stand. When the Philistines come, will stand until, until the, the sword freezes to your hand, until the Bible freezes to your hand. Hello? And then it will be time to move on. Time to take some more ground. Okay, so what about holding ground? Well, number one, ground holders protect the boundaries. Ehud led a very significant strategy, as I've mentioned already. The first thing they did is they went down to the crossing over point of the Jordan. They went to the fords of the Jordan, and it says they took possession of the fords of the Jordan. In other words, they went down, and they blocked the exit route. And then they annihilated all the Moabites that were still left in Israel, 10,000 strong and vigorous, the Bible tells us. So what's happened here is they are blocked off the exit routes. They have, they've slain everyone that remains in the land. Why? So that Moab cannot regroup on the other side and come in again and attack the border. They secure their border. They secure, their, they protect their boundary. Why is this important? Because we have to understand there are seasons of taking ground and then there are seasons of holding ground. And one of the things we have to do is protect the boundaries. Some of us, we've moved forward in 21 days of prayer because we shifted the boundaries of our lives. We shifted the boundaries of what we were going to look at, of, of what we were going to spend our time on, of, of how we were going to how we were going to pray, so some different things. There were some different boundaries for many of us, and that's why we've had this sense of we've taken ground. So what happens now? Well, well, I, I you see, part of part of what needs to happen is is we need to. Understand that, that although not everything might be able to sustain exactly where it is, there are maybe some boundaries that move that then need to be set in a certain place that's different to where they were before. Some of us, we might have taken ground in freedom in Christ in the autumn and find there were some internal confessions that we were wrestling with and God has highlighted them to us and given a new word of truth to confess and we have taken some ground. We've taken authority over those things, but we have to hold to that confession. Well, what we can find over time is some things that we used to stay, say, and now we stop saying, we start saying again. Hello? Well, why, why, why would you not protect your boundary? Why would you, why would you help, see the Lord help you to take ground and, and, and then give it away again? But we've got we've to be ready to protect the boundaries. There are, there's something that I used to confess over my life probably 16, 17 years ago, that I came to realize was not helping me. And God helped me to get a new word. He put a new word in my mouth. And since then, I have never said that again. I have sometimes thought about saying, I have nearly said it because I felt like it, but I refuse to say it. It will not come out of my mouth. Why? Because I, the Lord helped me take ground and establish a better boundary. I won't say it again. Because actually it's a lie. That's why I'm not going to say it. It was a lie in the first place. And I came to see that it was a lie. And I came to see that there was a better truth to confess over my life. And even when I feel like the lie is true, I'm going to, I know that it's a lie. Hello? We have to protect the boundaries. Secondly, ground holders occupy 
the territory. This is a really important point. I want to see something here. They occupy the territory. You see, the, the Bible says that, that Israel was subject to Moab for 18 years, but then it finishes the story. I love it. And it says, and Moab were subject to Israel. There's a switch. Moab was the son born to Lot when his eldest daughter made him drunk and slept with him. And then the, the next night, the younger daughter did the same. And Moab comes from that. Moab is a type of the flesh in Scripture. And what the story begins by saying that Israel was subject to Moab. You, you can read for that. The spirit was subject to the flesh. But then at the end of the story, it says, and then the flesh was subject to the spirit. This is part of what can happen when we take ground spiritually. And this is what happens in these times of, of prayer and fasting, that actually the, the, the spirit was subject to the flesh, but then the flesh becomes subject to the spirit. But what they did was they, they went down, they secured the boundaries, but then they reoccupied the land. They reoccupied the city of Palms. They went back into Jericho. They occupied the space that had been occupied somewhere else, and they lived in it. It's one of the reasons that they had peace for 80 years. They occupied that space. What does it mean? Well, what I think it means, what I've come to see is that when the Lord helps me to take ground, I can't necessarily permanently remain in that. When I first raised a hand in worship, I, I didn't go out of the church with my and never my hand has never come down since, or else I would have lost ground. No, it doesn't mean that. But what it meant was the next time I was in church, having broken through, guess what? Uh, it was important for me to raise a hand again to occupy the territory. It meant for me that, that when I first prayed and fasted for seven days and it was a breakthrough and I encountered God and I stepped forward, it was important that that wasn't the only time in my life I ever did it. It doesn't mean that then I, I never ate again from then until now or I would have lost ground. But if I've done seven days or I've done 14 days or I've done 21 days or I've done 40 days or, or then it's like, well, I, I don't wanna look back at that as a monument. I wanna be able to occupy that territory. If I found a place of freedom, then I want to stay in that place of freedom. Do you know what I'm talking about? If you found a place of courage to share your faith, don't let that be your testimony in 30 years' time. There was one time when I shared my faith with an unbeliever. Maybe to do that for the first time in your place of work is to take ground, is to step out. But you've got to do it again sometime. You've got to occupy that territory. This is really important. Faith, why don't you come and help me? We've got to live in what we've won. And finally, ground holders. I don't know if I've got this wrong. Sorry, saying ground holders, ground takers. Ground holders occupy the territory. Ground holders protect the boundary. And thirdly, ground holders, those who hold ground are positioned for more ground. Ground holders, those who take ground and hold ground are positioned for more ground. The Bible says, after Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goat or a cattle prod. They took some more ground. What happens when we take ground and we hold ground, we're positioned for the next ground. That this next level is the threshold for the next next level. I feel like I could start a rap. This next level's for the next, next level. We've got, a, we've got a whole ground because actually it's the springboard for taking more ground. And who knows that God doesn't want you to stay where you are. God wants you to keep moving forward. The, the picture of the Bible, the promise of Scripture, if we stay in Christ, if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, we will go from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from glory to glory. He is changing us. And, and we can move from where we were to somewhere new. And guess what? We, we might have a season where we occupy, but actually he wants to take us on beyond that. And then beyond that. And then beyond that. And then beyond that. Some of you, you're sensing a a stirring, some of our young people in particular, but not exclusively, a stirring, a, a sense of the call of God on your, on your life. And you don't know what it means, what it looks like. It's unspecified. You, you, you're not sure 
even what, what it's going to materialize as, and you're certainly not sure how you're going to get there, but something is stirring of the Holy Spirit in you. And you're not sure how it's going to come to pass. I'll tell you how it will come to pass. By taking today's ground and holding today's ground, and taking tomorrow's ground and holding tomorrow's ground, and just keep walking in step with the Holy Spirit, and you will enter into everything God has for you. Just keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Be a ground taker. Be a ground holder for the glory of God. Shall we pray? I'd love to invite us, church, to briefly respond. Firstly, for someone you know in, in the last season, maybe even since the start of the year, maybe, maybe through 2023, but you've been in a time where by the grace of God, you've taken some ground. And today you wanna to say, Lord, would you help me to hold ground? Would you help me to hold on to what you've helped me to win? So far, Lord, I, I, we'll come to taking more ground in a moment. But for those who wanna say, would you help me to hold ground? I'm just gonna invite you to stand where you are. I wanna pray for you. Those who say, Lord, help me to hold ground. Thank you for taking me forward. Thank you, God, for, for the journey. Lord, I know I'm not the man or the woman that you've called me to be, but I thank you, Lord, that you've helped me to take some steps forward. Would you help me, Lord, to hold ground? If that's you, just, just begin to speak to the Lord where you are, just quietly. Just talk to him. Bring it to him. Ask him to help you. Help you to not give away what you've won, but to stand in it to occupy it, to own it. Father, I pray for my brothers and my sisters. We thank you, Lord, for seasons of taking ground. We thank you, God, that you lead us forward. We thank you, Lord, that, that Lord, we might make mistakes, but thank you, Lord, that we're not where we used to be. And we thank you for that sense, Lord, that you've taken us from where we were into a new space. And Lord, we can be very much aware of our frailties and and our imperfections, but we thank you, Lord, that you've helped us to move forward in some regards. And I pray for my brothers and my sisters, and I pray, Lord, you would help every one of them to hold ground, to, to stay where you've brought them to, for the victories on the inside, for the confessions that have changed, for the depth of spirituality, for the strength of prayer, for the discipline. We thank you, Lord, for every victory that has been won. We thank you for every inch of ground that has been taken. And I pray for everyone that you would help them in the name of Jesus to protect the boundaries. I pray, Lord, you would help every one of them to occupy the territory, that every place that has been won, they would live in it, they would walk in it, they would confess it, they would hold, that when the day of evil comes, they would stand, they would remain, they would stay in the ground you have taken them into you and held them to hold ground, I pray in the name of Jesus. Now you might want to remain standing because I, I, I guess if that's you, you probably want to ask God to help you to take some more ground. But there might be others that want to join you and stand and say, Lord, would you help me that in 2024, it would be a ground-taking year. You'd help me to move forward. And if you can say amen to that, why don't you stand? Join those that are already standing. Lord, help us, Lord, to be a people of ground-takers. Help us to be people who move forward in the things of God. Lord, help us to be people who don't stay where we are, but move forward. Why don't you begin to lift your voice? It might help you to raise your hands and ask God to help you to take ground this year. I'll ask God to help you to move forward from where you are. Thank Him for His faithfulness. Thank Him for His goodness. But ask Him to help you to take some more ground. I thank you, Lord, for everything you've measured off, for every person here, for every confession, for every internal battle, for every insecurity that you are pushing aside, for every sense of inferiority that you want to lay waste to, for every internal wrestle and battle. I pray, God, for a season of ground taking. I pray, God, help us to move forward in the things of the Spirit. I pray, Holy God, help us to go from strength to strength and faith to faith. Lord, increase our prayer life. Increase the depth of our praying. Help us, God, to become men of God and women of God. Lord, not those who observe, but those who stand, those who fight, those who learn to lay hold of the kingdom of God, those through whom you would minister. Lord, you would put your grace and your power and your faith Lord, for your glory. Use us for your glory, we pray. Help us to take ground for your glory 
in the name of Jesus. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.